pleasure to see people here sticking around after the sharp lecture. It's a really nice introduction, I thought, or a nice transition from uh, the discussion that that Mike led us through, which was great. And um, so the transition here is courtesy of Spaceman Spiff. Um, Andrew sent this when we were when we were talking about this session. Andrew sent this this cartoon around, and essentially, when you get to the part down around the boot print. This is, suddenly our hero realizes that this landscape was not created by geological forces. So, I just wanted to, mine is a very brief introduction to the, to the concept, which is essentially that we spend um, a tremendous amount of time focusing as a community as, on these natural geologic, the classical geologic processes. And if you, um, but there's also this other set that is uh, quite a different category, and this is, um, essentially, humans, if you start to consider humans as a geomorphological agent, um, the landscape that we talk about becomes a very different story. And what I think is really interesting about the talks that we're going to hear today, and the reason uh, we're very lucky to have the two in invited speakers we do, is that um, what I think what often scares the geomorphologists is that it's very hard to take um, the tools of physical dynamics and, and talk about them in terms of, in context of um, agriculture, housing construction. These are, these are social di dynamics, these are economic dynamics, and those are not, um, you know, those are, humans are tough to work with. We're, we're pretty messy beings. And it's, it's but it's not, it's not a matter of sort of uh, philosophy in this case. This is, we can argue it, it's a matter of the, the imperative is in scale. We move around more of the surface of the earth than you know, than these natural processes do when uh, when you tabulate it up. This is a sample from one of Peter Half's papers um, in 2003, and he was borrowing it from Roger Hook, uh, who's who have been thinking about humans as forces on Earth and and sort of the quantities that we move around, and essentially taking um, a dynamical approach to you know when we when we talk about housing construction or moving. Um, human systems moving around the Earth's surface, how do we do that? What are, what are the dynamical properties um, in those questions? And so we're very lucky today. Um, we're going to begin, Peter Half is going to begin um, this session, the future of human landscape systems. So, Peter. Yeah, th <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Eli. Uh, the title of my talk, uh, Driving the Landscape, refers to uh, human influences on the direction of landscape change in the future. The content of my talk is uh, somewhat modified from what's written in the abstract, <clears throat> but uh, I, w I will be focusing on the future of human landscape interaction, but particularly on the far future, so not tomorrow, not a couple decades, but off toward the end of this century and beyond. Uh, it seems like a long time away, but it is within the probable lifespan of uh, our grandchildren, or your grandchildren anyway. And uh, so I think it's important to try to frame our thinking about it, even though we can't say much in, in detail. Uh, off a hundred years in the future or so, the landscape in its relation to humans is unpredictable. We basically don't know anything definite about what it will look like. So I'm not making any predictions uh, in this talk, but I would like as an alternative to run several uh, scenarios for landscape change uh, by you. So by a scenario is a typical way of sketching out possible futures when we really don't know what the actual future is gonna be. <clears throat> And the one thing I will assume is that technology, which is already a large force in the world, will remain a large force and a growing force in the future. And so I want to talk about technology a minute because it's kind of the key to what I'm talking about. I imagine that the sum of all technology is, is, is forms what I call the technosphere. It's more or less, less the same as what other people call the anthroposphere. And it includes all the human-connected stuff that you might imagine, communication and transportation networks, 
uh, business and commercial systems, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, bureaucracies and institutions of the military, government, universities, and what have you. The built environment, cities and infrastructure, that includes agriculture, and then all the parts that make up those larger systems, uh, including, importantly, human parts that I take to be an inseparable part of the technosphere. We can't get away from it even if we wanted to. And also the software on which the hardware of the technosphere runs, that is the rules of economics and, and law and social customs and so on. And so within this uh, overgrowth on the present surface of the Earth, the landscape is sitting there and uh, it must evolve uh, under those conditions. I look at the technosphere um, as, a geo as an emerging geologic paradigm potentially a little bit like the biosphere or, or the hydrosphere. It shares some properties with these venerable uh, Earth systems. It's global. It's energetic. It uses energy at 10 or 20 percent of the rate of the biosphere. It, it co-ops landscape into its own form and function, uh, like, like the biosphere does. It transforms landscape. It changes landscape at, as it performs its function, a little bit like the hydrosphere. Uh, and it's very large, it's complex, it's not under anybody's control, it's, and it's beyond our understanding of what the, we don't understand how the technosphere works, we don't understand the dynamics, but it does have its own dynamics. It's so large there's no person can understand what's happening, and so how can it be so vigorous and have lasted these number of uh, decades and, and centuries is because it has its own dynamics. In other words, it's, it's autonomous, or at least quasi-autonomous, beyond human control. However, humans are locked into the technosphere. We all are locked into it, um, both by coercion and, uh, and more, more importantly, by incentives that the technosphere gives, it, gives us. We want what it has, and so we act in a way to support its, uh, support its operation. And then, so wh what is the fate of landscape in this uh, kind of out-of-control system that's uh, surging across the, uh, across the surface of the planet? What will landscape be like over in the, farther, in the farther future. And so let me rule out extreme landscapes, such as you know, runaway greenhouse effect uh, that may, would be abiotic, and simply look at uh, the smaller collection of landscapes that I call existential landscapes. These are landscapes on which uh, our children or grandchildren uh, could survive if, uh, and perhaps uh, would have a reasonable amount of well-being. And so then we ask for these landscapes uh, what is it about landscape that is essential for human existence and human well-being? And the essential product that landscape provides is what's called natural capital. That's all the things that, is, that are not included in the standard economic accounting, but which are uh, essential for our, for our existence, uh, such as fertile soil, uh, fresh water, abundant resources, uh, preformed structural information, including genetic information, and also many processes like the storage and filtration of water. A landscape provides a foundation under which all the other spheres operate, an important part of natural capital, not usually included in, uh, in a listing. I also include climate here because although climate is separate, it's very closely tied to what landscape is. And then it includes, then landscape also provides other other factors that are valuable for, for humans. So I want to just run through four, quickly through four landscape scenarios that uh, in light of the fact or in consequence of the fact that natural capital will be essential for our, our survival uh, into the future. That technology, however, is destroying natural capital. That's the cause of the current environmental crisis. And humans are entrained in the technosphere whether they like it or not. You and me are bonded to the technosphere with Un unbreakable bonds and you can't get loose from it no matter what, what you do and it drags you along and you have to pay a certain amount of respect to it and help to help it maintain its, its metabolism. That's how the system works. However, um, we're not just dust motes on the, in the atmosphere. We are you know, potentially reactive and responsive parts so that in, in that lies uh, our chance to have an influence on our future if, even if we can't control it. So the first landscape, as I call the logistic landscape, is basically if we do nothing and current trends continue, so we see increased depletion of resources, increased consequences of global warming. And uh, in, a, in a logistic uh, model, when the biological population be goes beyond its carrying capacity, either the population will crash or go into severe and dislocating oscillations 
Um, the technosphere is currently operating beyond its carrying capacity and therefore beyond our, the carrying capacity that is available to us. And so without going to the extreme of, a, of, a, of an apocalyptic end to a human existence, um, we could imagine crashes or oscillations that were very disruptive of human resistance, uh, existence and, and the consequent landscapes that would um, inform those that would be present under those conditions would be marginal depleted landscapes, depleted in natural uh, capital, eroded landscapes, dried out landscapes, flooded landscapes, uh, toxified soils, and so on. And I think this is one of the four scenarios that are in our, potentially in our future. Uh, I don't know how likely it is. I think it's a possibility. It does, re assu it does assume unresponsive human parts, us, us being the human parts. However, we are responsive creatures. We might respond slowly, as apparently we are. But uh, that's our hope that we are, our responsiveness comes into, comes into gear. On a more hopeful, a more hopeful landscape, scenario, what I call the National Geographic landscape. This is the dream of green environmentalists, and it's the goal of all environmental academic programs and schools uh, that I know of, including, including my own. The idea is to tap down or, or rein in the technosphere to uh, try to reduce this prodigious use of, uh, of energy and research resources to uh, preserve natural capital for human needs and to somehow return or preserve the landscape like it used to be like our grandparents knew it, or like used to be in the pages of the National, National Geographic. I think this is an unlikely landscape future because it goes against the grain of the technosphere. The technosphere is a, is a, is a strong consumer of, of energy and resources because it's built on, on nature's discovery of very strong positive feedback loops that finally evolved to, to suckle on the uh, on the abundant uh, chemical resources that the earth has to offer and were, were not tappable before until nature had evolved human intelligence and, and, and the technosphere. So and the thing about positive feedback loops is that they, they resist being, being changed. That's why, they're, that's why they're there. And if, if that weren't the case, then fluctuations would bring the whole system down. So uh, it's really tough to go this route, and, and we see that in the difficulties in, in, in uh, kind of in, in inducing uh, reasonable environmental uh, policies to deal with some of these problems. So I think this is a maybe not the most likely future. Another way to preserve some natural capital that is quite controversial, I think it's actually a more likely future than the National Geographic uh, future landscape, is, is, is a consequence of geoengineering the climate. We know with very high certainty that it's possible for us with existing technology more or less and really cheaply to dial down the atmospheric temperature of the Earth a couple degrees by, uh, by increasing Earth's albedo. Uh, the trouble is, and so that would relieve one issue having to do with global warming, but the problem is that local distributions of precipitation, temperature, uh, cloudiness, windiness, and so on are likely not to be preserved so that the distribution of weather, distribution of weather as opposed to climate um, might be radically different from what it is now in a geoengineered world. So the consequence of that would be the landscapes anywhere you were dropped down would be familiar landscapes in terms of process, but they would be displaced from where such landscapes are today. So landscape would, landscapes would be scrambled and with consequent very large effect, negative effects on human populations. The reason I think this is a not unlikely landscape is because it maintains energy use of the technosphere. It's, it's what I call technosphere compliant. In fact, it enables us to go to even continue increasing our use of energy as we are doing currently at a couple percent a year. Um, this is the main wrap against the geoengineering is that it will allow us to continue business as usual, but I, I think that's actually the reason why it's likely to happen. It's a, it's a, pain, it's a less, less painful future, at least in the short run. Um, or it could be imagined as such. And my final, my final landscape is, uh, is my furthest out one, uh, say a century or more in the future. I call this the techno landscape, where we do imagine that technological capital can replace natural capital. So we no longer have to depend on most of the things that landscape does for us today. today. This would mainly be a recycling, the, pro the uh, technological capital would mainly be a recycling process. Uh, recycling is probably the most important thing that the, uh, that the, um, that the uh, 
uh, that natural capital provides, provides for us. Um, global warming is a recycling problem. It's not an energy problem. Okay, if we put back the carbon into the ground, then no matter how much energy we use, then that problem would go away. So if, 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 we, if we went down this path and landscape no longer provided us essentials, then it becomes kind of a free resource that technology could then use without compromising itself to do, to make whatever, and we really can't imagine what that is. But, so, I, so landscape then becomes kind of really unknown. I'll give you my last slide, which is after this one, I'll give you one example. But this is a very energy intensive landscape because recycling is very energy intensive because you're going against the second law of thermodynamics. But it's highly technospheric compliant as well. That's why I think it, uh, this, the route to this kind of a future um, may not be one that we will avoid in the long run. Then what is the final landscape? Talking about the far, far future, well, of course, nobody knows. That's why I'm telling scenarios. But it's really a process, not a state. Uh, it's presumably we never come to any final balance. It's all, we're always dealing and coping with the next new, new problem. The, the planet is being technologized, however, and I think that's the, that's the main trend. The technology function, functions as kind of a universal acid. It, uh, it dissolves everything it comes into contact with, including nature, and recrystallizes it into its own form. So I think the planet is in the process of becoming a, really a, tech, a technological artifact uh, uh, in, in and of itself. So if I had to give, I was pressed to give, well, can you give one example of what that might be? And, and no, not really. But if, if, uh, if Moore's law, that is the computation power doubles every, every, every year at fixed cost, continues for the next couple of decades, then we'll have something like a Mac power book available for every square meter of the, land, of the Earth's uh, surface area. So I can imagine a, a transistorized landscape with millions of, uh, say, sand grains that were actually uh, transistorized on the landscape. It would be a runoff of the environmental energy fluxes, uh, which would be, uh, are pretty large, actually. Um, and in, some, in a certain sense, it would be networked. In a certain sense, the, la sense the landscape wakes up, becomes aware. And with nanotechnology, there are, there are schemes on, on the books to uh, to build nano devices that can that can recon, reconfigure themselves. So I would see that the new modes of self-organization of the landscape uh, could emerge based on the fact that it's now kind of an aware living skin of the earth. Uh, that's is that science fiction? Well, it's fiction. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's science fiction, but the the, the point being that uh, technology is going to very likely dominate what happens to the future of the earth of the landscape. In the, in the far future. And so what I'm trying to do here is simply frame those questions, not to make any predictions. And, and so what, what is the final state of landscape? It might even be that it's not a frightening landscape because we ha technology incentivizes us. It has to make us feel good enough to help doing the stuff we do to keep technology moving on. So maybe the future landscape would be an idyllic, very pleasing landscape that appealed to our sense of biophilia. This may be the best place to get uh, the National Geographic landscape back in the picture. But I think it will always be a fraught landscape because we'll know that behind it all there's something large and complex and fast moving that we don't understand. And I think one, one, one other final consequence is that, and I think you see it today, that our psychological attachment to landscape uh, will be diminished in a way in the future that it may no longer be the place of a kind of rest and repose and contemplation that we can go to get away from. Uh, all the things that Technosphere is currently doing to the Earth, and that may become an impossible and non-existing refuge in the future. Anyway, thank, thank you very much. Questions? We've got time for some questions. If there are some questions out there. How can you not ask a question after that? In your talk for these four different scenarios, you make it sound almost like it's, there's an inevitability towards one of them, but humans don't have any, societally, we don't have any influence over how, which one of these four choices we're going to go to. And am, I, am I understanding? Your uh, I think our, in, and, and what, yeah, no, what that's, societal influence yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I think the point I was trying to make is that we have a lot less influence than, than we think because we imagine that technology is human constructed and that somehow we're in control of it because, I mean, 
we make it, we design it, we, de we deploy it. If it wasn't for us, it, would, it wouldn't be there. But I think that's, at, at some point, the complexity of the system got, got large enough that that, that that link was kind of broken, so it's not like we just have a stone tool anymore that we, we have. For example, um, you know, you have a refrigerator in your house and you think, well, you know, I went and I bought the refrigerator, it's my refrigerator, my beer is in there, if I want it, I come home, I open the door, I get it out, I close it, and uh, oh, I even get a new one one day. That's my refrigerator and I control what it does. And I would argue that, no, you don't, you don't really entirely, entirely control that refrigerator because it shares a part of the autonomy of the, of the technosphere that makes it very resistant for humans to do anything with it. For example, it's very difficult for you to go in and unplug your refrigerator and, and wait a few days. Basically, you won't, you won't do that. It's pretty much guaranteed. Okay? Under some special circumstances, one person might do it. But we're really locked into this. So, but it doesn't mean we have no influence, and I think the geoengineering landscape is the one I showed where uh, there would be some rising, you know, under what circumstances, I mean, f how could you imagine that, that, that some political entity would go out and try to change the climate of the whole world? And uh, I think that happens when the pain gets big enough or when the fear gets big enough, when it's imagined that there's some existential threat to to either human, well, to existential threat to humans, that is to their existence, or else a very severe threat to their well-being, then some political entity, presumably a, a technologically advanced country, will go ahead and do it. And it's something that can be done. Putting sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere cost you maybe $50 billion a year done with pretty much off-the-shelf, more or less off-the-shelf technology. It's even reversible because if you stop and then a few years, those, those things fall out of the atmosphere. So. Um, you know that that would be a particular landscape future that was driven by 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 human response, but it has to be it won't be one person or even a small group of people. It has to be some some uh, property that namely fear that percolates down to to uh, you know to a large enough, enough enough group that collectively that that action could be taken. But yeah, I think that I think that link is just weaker than one supposes. But not not that it's not there. I think it's a good question. Any others? Yes and no. It's a, it's a supplement to natural capital to start with. But when it, it basically enables vastly larger populations and, and therefore vastly larger energy use, and then with all the multiplying effects of that, it kind of comes back to bite you in terms of drawing down natural capital. Um, at least that's how I would, you know, that's how I would, I would look at it. So, so, the question, so if you ask the question, can technology replace natural capital now? And you might offer examples like the Haber-Bosch process. Um, I'd say the answer is no. Definitely not. The technology today is tightly tied to natural capital. If, natural, if the natural goods and services that nature provide disappeared, we would be toast, including technology. It would, it would collapse very, 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 very soon. So, um, so I'm imagining, you know, for example, if you look at where technology is on the surface of the earth, it is very closely exactly in the geographic places where natural capital is large. So it's even a local effect. Um, uh, so I think it's a long way to go before, and if it could, the technology could replace natural capital. But the one thing we know about technology, it moves fast. You can't really anticipate what it's going to what's going to turn up. So I offer that as a, just a possibility. I'm not recommending it, by the way. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Um, so our, our next invited speaker is Brad Werner from the University of California, San Diego. Um, the title of his talk is, um, is it starts with a question: Is the Earth <coughs> uh, is the Earth fucked? I'll uh, I'll just I'll I'll turn it over to Brad <laughs> right after that.
Well, I thought that my talk was going to be kind of a downer, but <laughs> Peter's was reset the bar on that. Um, uh, but I really appreciate um, Peter's like organized approach to thinking about um, about these problems, and I know I've learned a lot, and I hope uh, you did today too. Um, I'm going to invite you into my somewhat less organized way of thinking and um, scattered uh, approach to um, to some of these issues um, today, and um, you know we'll see what happens. Um, so um, I, I kind of th I thought about um, this talk, basically motivated by a bunch of my friends who are quite depressed about the future, the future of the earth. Um, and not so much just like, uh, you know, all the good science is, um, you know, being done all over the world, but a lot of it being presented here about what the future holds. Um, not so much depressed by that, but by the seeming inability to, to respond appropriately to it. And, and so, um, so what I want to think about today or talk about today is, is basically how can we think as geophysicists, um, you know, I'm not a humanities person or social scientist, um, but as a geophysicist, how can we think about um, the future of the Earth um, in the sense that it is, is very much dependent and coupled with um, uh, human social processes. So, let's see, what do I do? This thing? Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, oops. Okay. Something's happening. Um, but anyway, why is that up there? Okay. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but anyway, um, I think you can uh, you get the idea. Um, Basically, there's, um, you know, as Peter talked about and so many people have talked about in the past, um, there's this increasing interaction between human societies and natural processes. Humans are impacting the earth in, uh, um, you know, innumerable ways. Um, but that impact is also coming back and affecting us. Um, so the climate is warming and that's... Uh, um, having an effect on humans, um, uh, causing various kinds of adaptions and so forth. Um, and so how do we think about, how do we think about that system? And of course, there's all sorts of elements to, to that problem. Some of them are moral and ethical and philosophical um, aspects to these problems, and those are really important. Um, but as geophysicists, you know, many of us don't feel really competent to um, to engage in that kind of thinking. Um, but there's also um, other aspects uh, to this interaction um, that are very familiar to us as geophysicists in the sense that they're dynamical, in the sense that um, um, there's something happening um, um, in the interaction of humans and the landscape that, that the kinds of techniques that you know, we're used to in thinking about just uh, uh, natural processes are potentially applicable, and that's what I want to talk about. Um, so today, um, I'm going to, I'm really going to focus more on methodology. So instead of like giving scenarios or predictions in the future, I want to just think, start thinking about like how how can we um, approach these problems, and you know I'll just take a few baby steps in that direction. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a uh, methodology for thinking about dynamics that involves um, something called uh, studies of complex systems, and we'll be looking at the coupled human environmental system. And I'll look at various aspects of it, and I'll make some, some very general dynamical arguments. Um, and then um, kind of near the end, I'll talk a little, little bit about a, a model. Um, so that's... That's good. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about um, uh, dynamics and a kind of a framework for thinking about dynamics. Um, when we're, we're thinking about um, coupled human environmental systems, they're very complicated. Humans are complicated. 
Uh, but environmental systems are complicated too, and you put the two together, um, it's, a, it's a very difficult problem. Um, so like having a good framework to, to kind of put all of our, our dynamical um, uh, ways of thinking about things together in a, in a fairly organized manner, not too organized for me, um, is useful. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about a few of those. Um, i just introduce those, and then we'll, we'll look at the human environmental uh, coupled problem. Um, so first of all, um, uh, a concept you're familiar with, and maybe not this name, but um, it's just the concept of time scale. If you look at various kinds of dynamics, if you push or pull on it, if you perturb it, um, it'll react with some uh, time scale. Um, and we can use that time scale then as a way of organizing dynamics. Um, so we can organize dynamics by time scale. And so when we look at a complicated system with all sorts of things going on, um, we can take things that are, that are very fast responding to perturbations, very fast time scales, put them in one category, and um, things that are intermediate, somewhere in the middle in terms of their time scale, put them in another, and things that are really sluggish uh, put them in another category. And it turns out um, that we can, if we do that, we basically get what's almost um, like separate descriptions of the system. And I call those levels of description, but they're basically different ways of describing a system. So if you look at a fluid, you can describe it in terms of its molecules, but you could also describe it in terms of um, various uh, levels of, of, of uh, fluid flow, um, you could look in detail at all the, um, um, uh, the, the fluid flow vectors throughout the fluid, or you can get some set, sort of average overall number. Um, so there's different ways of describing a system, and those break down um, in terms of the dy dynamics by time scale. Um, if we look at each of those descriptions, we can kind of do the typical thing that we do as physicists, so the physicist part of uh, our geophysics nature. Um, and that is to look at the variables, the, the, the kinds of measurements that you would make on the system, and track those through time. And of course, the dynamics then is what's going to be causing those variables to change. So we can basically construct a phase space that includes both those dynamics and, uh, I'm sorry, both the variables and the dynamics for each level of description. Um, and then we can look a little bit more carefully at the dynamics. Um, and there are various categories of dynamics. One of those is very linear uh, dynamics or nonlinear dynamics. Linear dynamics is basically weak interactions between the elements of the system. Uh, nonlinear dynamics is strong interactions. Um, and we can use that category of dynamics to, to basically say what parts of the system or what parts of the world should we focus on when we're looking at this system. So, um, if we then define the system as everything that's nonlinearly connected, that gives us a very good way of, of uh, you know, defining what the system is using its own dynamics. And then anything that's outside in the external environment is just linearly coupled, and we don't need to look, look, look at or think about it too carefully. Um, as time scale increases, as the duration of an interaction increases, uh, linear interactions turn into nonlinear interactions. So if you go up in level of description to a longer time scale, um, the, uh, the system, the extent of the system will increase. Um, another category of dynamics that's very important in a general sense is dissipation. And dissipation does a lot of very useful things in, in terms of uh, helping us understand uh, dynamics. Um, one, of, one of them is dissipation. Dissipation is basically uh, damping. It, it brings things that are different closer together. So if you look in phase space, for example, it'll bring uh, trajectories in phase space closer together if you have a dissipative interaction. Um, and so that dissipation can lead to preferred configurations, also known as attractors. And if there's a change in the external environment, the, the part of the world that's linearly coupled to our system, that can lead to, can, can lead to a destabilization of the attractor and a bifurcation. Uh, and the last um, kind of uh, set of tools then that I want to focus on 
concerns how the different levels of description in this dynamical system are coupled together. Um, the different levels of description, as I said, are kind of like separate ways of describing the system. And so there has to be some, some distance, something that uh, separates them out. And that um, uh, is basically known as scale separation. And it comes about, it's basically due to dissipation. So um, um, on, if you look at the dynamics on faster time scales, um, if there's sufficient dissipation, those dynamics will uh, dissipate, will decay over the longer time scale of the next level of description up. And so, so we can get scale separation between the levels and we can treat them semi-separately. Of course, they're not completely um, uh, separate in the sense that um, there are connections between the levels. Um, uh, basically, feedback is a, is a way of describing connections between levels of description. Um, um, so fast time scale interactions will support the emergence through feedbacks of a longer time scale level of description. And that longer time scale level of description to complete the feedback loop um, uh, provides the context in which the fast time scales can do that. Um, so there's basically cooperative interactions between the levels um, that do tie them together and do provide a constraint on the dynamics. So these different levels are not completely separate, but they're constrained in, in some ways. Um, we can also think of that uh, kind of more typically in terms of self-organization, where the interactions at the faster time scale um, have an enduring aspect to them, which is expressed at the longer time scale. And then we can also think of the longer time scale as providing a context for what the, uh, what's going on at the faster time scale is going to do, um, basically slaving what um, the, the fast time scales. So that's a little introduction to dynamics. Um, and now let's think about the, the problem of um, coupling of um, using, using those concepts of coupled human uh, environmental interactions. And um, basically, if we think about these interactions in terms of um, uh, the present culture that we, we live in, and I agree with Peter, that um, is going to continue um, uh, into the indefinite future. It's a very well-defended system. Um, so it's a capitalist culture. Um, uh, dominated by um, economic dynamics. And one of the um, very important uh, dynamical characteristics of capitalist culture is the tendency to uh, attempt to reduce the, the dissipation of transactions. Um, and so it's, you know, it used to be difficult to, to, to get food. You had to grow it yourself or um, had to go through a lot to get it. But now I can just go into a 7-Eleven and buy a banana. Um, it's much easier. The dissipation involved in obtaining food has uh, decreased markedly. And that also um, holds for communications and other sorts of technological um, aspects of the capitalist system. And so, um, so we can ask ourselves, well, if dissipation is reduced, what is the dynamical consequence of that? Um, and there's two um, very robust um, um, and important um, dynamical concepts of reducing dissipation. Um, one is uh, as you reduce dissipation, as you reduce friction in the system, um, that promotes instability. Basically, the existence of well-defined attractors in the system depends on dissipation. If you take away the dissipation or reduce it markedly, um, that promotes instability in the system. Um, not surprising given, uh, given kind of our observations of the capitalist uh, economic system. And another um, aspect, um, which is also important and critical, I think, for our interaction with um, the environment, is if you reduce dissipation, um, basically that makes it much harder for a, a, a new level of description above the fast time scales at which transactions are happening in a capitalist economy to develop because basically um, you have to, the, over the time scale, the longer time scale level of description, the fast scale uh, 
dynamics has to dissipate, and if you reduce dissipation, that's much more difficult. Essentially what that means is you, um, the, the gulf, the, the time uh, scale difference between well-defined levels of description has to increase. Um, and so the result is, is basically an, an alienation of the longer time scale cultural aspects in, within a capitalist economy from the, the fast time scale, low dissipation uh, dynamics that characterizes transactions, communication, et cetera. Um, and so the implication then for, um, for human society's interaction with um, uh, environmental processes is that um, uh, basically uh, nonlinear two-way interactions um, can exist and be focused at the fast time scales, um, but we're basically missing that kind of interaction, that kind of uh, back and forth between what we do and how the uh, environmental processes react um, at the intermediate time scales. And as a society, we're, um, because of the low dissipation, we're alienated from the long time scale um, culture. And so our, our ability to, uh, to react and control um, how our interaction with the environment plays out over long time scales is much reduced. And this is basically just a consequence then of this um, reduced dissipation that is an essential characteristic of capitalism. Um, so now we can look at um, um, the role that environmental management plays in, um, um, in this dynamical system, in this capitalist dynamical system. Um, and so the basic, um, to, to kind of uh, simplify it, the basic role that uh, management plays is to attempt to filter um, these fast time scale um, um, economic actions um, in order to, um, to create a, a, a longer time scale uh, interaction with, uh, uh, with environmental processes. Um, so that process then has the potential to, to kind of correct for um, um, uh, some of the excesses basically of the very fast time scale oriented capitalist culture. However, um, because of the alienation of management and everything else within our society from the, the longest time scales of culture. Um, basically, um, over even just uh, intermediate time scales, we would expect that this management filter would become um, slave to and a part of, of this, um, um, uh, of the capitalist uh, culture dynamics. And basically that is expressed through um, the predominance in um, in management of using cost-benefit calculations, which are essentially economic calculations which, um, which just uh, make the time scale of the interactions a little bit longer. A third um, part of um, the culture, or to some extent outside the culture, um, that's not often talked about, but, but it's actually a very important part of the world we live in is resistance. And resistance is basically when uh, people or group of, groups of people step outside the culture. That is basically they adopt a certain set of dynamics that is not, does not fit within the capitalist culture. Um, and so we, we all know, um, you know uh, examples of, of resistance um, um, the rebellions in, um, in Southwest um, Asia and North Africa of uh, a couple years ago, the Occupy movement and going back further, um, the anti-slavery uh, uh, movements, uh, civil rights movements, etc. These are all examples of resistance of people stepping outside the accepted um, culture um, and had uh, tremendous influence on um, uh, on basically uh, how the dominant culture um, evolved. So, um, so basically, uh, this is suggestive that if we're thinking about um, the future of the Earth and the future of our coupling to the environment, we have to include um, resistance as part of 
uh, part of that dynamics. And one of the, the hopeful, I guess, aspects of resistance is that, um, is that basically in resistance culture, um, unlike in capitalist culture, um, they're, they're high, the dynamics are highly dissip dissipative and there's, um, there's not this uh, alienation from the long times, uh, from the intermediate and long time scales at the fast time scales. And so we would expect then in general that resistance could play a role in um, providing for a more stable, dissipative, and sustainable future. Um, and one last dynamical argument uh, I want to give, um, uh, and it's kind of close to my heart in the sense that I am primarily a modeler, um, is, is what is the role of, um, of uh, models of your system, predictive models, um, for the future of Earth systems and coupled human Earth systems. And I'll just kind of refer to this as like a virtual Earth. Um, and I think it, it, uh, there are several ways to look at it, but um, um, one of which is the virtual Earth, unlike uh, the, the actual Earth, is its dynamics, its kind of internal dynamics, it's representing, of course, the actual Earth, which has very long time scales. But it's the way it interacts within our culture is, is on intermediate to fast time scales. That is, um, a virtual Earth uh, simulations are being steered to some extent by, by funding agencies, by managers, um, uh, by basically a culture which is focused on largely on fast time scales. And so virtual Earth has the potential to, to basically replace the actual Earth as, as our way of interacting with the, the natural environment um, and, and basically thereby kind of relieving us of any pressure to, to examine um, the processes within our culture that are eliminating these intermediate um, time scales and alienating us from the long time scales. Um, so there's a lot more to say about that, but I'll just kind of skip forward. I'm not sure if you want to cut me off or if I can go a little bit further. Um, I just want to talk very briefly about a numerical model, um, which um, is in its initial stages, but, um, but basically I feel that these dynamic arguments I've given you are a, you know, a starting place to start looking at um, the dynamics of this coupled system and, and potentially trying to make some predictions about things that we, we can predict. Um, and so this first step would basically be to take these dynamical arguments and within some sort of model that's not completely crazy, try to reproduce what they're, um, you know, what they're saying. And then the next steps would be to, um, to take, uh, take those ideas and extend them to, to modeling actual Earth subsystems and eventually the global Earth. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to give you any details um, because of time considerations, but, um, but basically I've constructed a preliminary agent-based uh, numerical model, which includes basically all the things I've just talked about. So it includes, agent, um, um, it includes like a capitalist economy, which is focused at fast time scales in purple, it includes um, management decisions at fast and intermediate time scales in blue, includes the uh, environmental systems both as resources and, and uh, damage that human impact has on those systems, and also resistance systems which are um, attempting to, to push against um, and um, influence the uh, management and economic part of the system. Um, so I'm just going to show you really fast a couple of uh, um, results from that, um, but it's still ongoing. So, so basically this is just with the economic part of the model, not management or resistance. Economics uh, interacting with uh, um, a, a set of uh, um, natural resources, 200 natural resources, um, 
and basically just starting off uh, the simulation and letting the economy run and seeing what kind of uh, uh, environmental damage happens, et cetera. And basically what happens is not too surprising is basically um, the, um, uh, the economy basically very fast, uh, fastly uh, chews up the environmental um, resources, uh, depletes those reservoirs, uh, and resulting in a significant amount of environmental damage. Um, and then adding um, management to that, um, so the previous results are shown in red and the management results are shown in black. Um, basically what management does is it puts a little bit of a longer time scale into the simulation, um, so it delays the depletion of the resources and delays the environmental damage but it doesn't um, prevent it. Um, and then um, the next step, which I would show you, is um, um, resistance uh, added to that, but I don't quite have that yet. Um, so in conclusion, um, uh, sorry this went on so long. Um, uh, basically I've argued that um, the dissipation in capitalist systems uh, leads to uh, alienation of fast time scales from the intermediate and the long time scales. And that has some very uh, significant um, implications for our, the way that we interact with the environment. Environmental managers um, um, basically uh, can slow down that process, can uh, put in a little bit of um, uh, slower time scales into the system. Uh, but basically, as part of that, uh, system, uh, it's inevitable that um, uh, that economic factors are going to dominate um, what decisions are made. Um, resistance has the potential to um, to influence uh, longer time scale management, and so the future um, sustainable uh, um, uh, sustainability of the coupled human environmental system may well depend on the strength of resistance and the ways that um, uh, the society acts to suppress that resistance, which it often does. Um, and finally, um, virtual Earth um, uh, has the potential, the potentially negative potential to, uh, to reinforce these, these uh, unsustainable tendencies in the society. Um, and so as as uh, as people who uh, at least some of you are are working on uh, such models, um, I think it it is uh, incumbent on us to to think about the impact of our the potential dynamical impact of our um, uh, of our work and our simulations. Um, but finally, the, the the main point is really that. Um, Considering the dynamics of the human environmental coupled system, it's really a geophysics problem, or at least a big part of it is, um, and it's not something that we can just leave for the social scientists or the humanities. Thank you. Um, I actually I agree with you there. I didn't I didn't talk about that, but um, but the way that resistance employs virtual earth is very different from the way that managers and the economic system employ it. And so one of the possibilities that we as um, geophysicists might think about is how we can put those results into the hands of of people carrying out that resistance. And I, I totally agree that because. Uh, the resistance has these long time scales. There's the potential to use that information in a different way than the um, uh, the political uh, economic system does. Any other
I think that is, um, that is, that's a very important point. Um, resistance is reactive. Um, it's not, it doesn't just exist in and of itself. It, it exists because, um, because of the, 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 I mean, in an environmental sense, it consists of, uh, or it exists because of the um, unsustainable aspects of the dominant culture. And, and so, and, be, and also because resistance has, uh, tends to have longer time scales, um, there is a question about whether resistance can really act to, um, uh, to oppose these forces because of, the, because of lags that exist within the system. Um, certainly a lot of negative things happen and then there is a period of time in which a resistance movement builds and oftentimes by that time a resistance movement becomes strong enough to influence uh, the outcomes, uh, a, a lot of damage has occurred. Um, so I think, um, I think to, to, to maybe think about it, hopefully, um, one of the things that, um, that is in my model, which doesn't work quite yet, but, um, um, but, I th but it's also in the real world, is that different uh, disparate resistance movements can have uh, nonlinear um, positive feedback uh, type interactions amongst themselves. And so um, even though individual resistance movements might not be um, uh, fast enough reacting to, to some of these problems, if a global movement, environmental movement, develops that is strong enough, um, that has the potential to, to have a big impact um, in, in a timely manner. So I hope I answered your question. Um, that's a really good question, and and that is something I'm very interested in, but it's extremely difficult to model. Um, um, but but I also think there's an argument that at least for the near future, um, there isn't going to be that kind of transformation because I think if you just look historically, and I look at it from a dynamic sense, um, the capitalist system has been extremely effective at adapting and protecting itself against uh, various challenges. So I think that's indicative that, it of course doesn't predict the future, but it, it does indicate that this is a system that has developed means to, uh, to remain uh, in place. And so I think it's, it's not an unreasonable assumption to say at least for the immediate uh, or foreseeable future um, that uh, this is probably going to be, some variant of this is going to be the system we're going to be dealing with.